The 29th of May 1900 was a landmark date for the British because this is what the Second Anglo-Boer War was all about, also known as the South African War. That had started in October the previous year and everybody maintained that the war was about gold, that Britain wanted the gold and that's why they took on the Boer republics. Uh, they wanted control and Johannesburg was in front of them on the 29th of May. Lord Roberts's army had marched all the way from Bloemfontein in quick time. They were exhausted, they were on short rations, but there were 40,000 of them. And in front of them, along the line of hills, a ridge that stretched between Ranfontein in the west to Germiston in the, uh, in the southeast, there were only 6,000 Boers with only about 12 cannon. So the British had an absolutely overwhelming force. But the Boers, of course, had a good position. And um, it was actually a huge battle. Um, if one follows a couple of, a, a week before when Lord Roberts crossed the Vol River, there were a lot of movements, a lot of troops uh, deployed, a lot of uh, cavalry, uh, small engagements, pushing the Boers back. And I don't really want to focus on all of that. I just want to keep it quite short and focus on one aspect. Um, and here I'm influenced because my family two generations, three generations ago came from Scotland and uh, from two cities, from Aberdeen and from Edinburgh. Now, mainly the Aberdeen side of the family usually joined up the Gordon Highlanders. So that is why I just chose the Gordon Highlanders and their role in Gruenkorp in the battle for Johannesburg. But before we start on the 29th of May, 1900, we're going to go back five years. And I call this the Gordon Highlanders and General Ham Ian Hamilton's revenge. Now, Ian Hamilton was a young lieutenant at the Battle of Majuba on the 27th of February, 1880. And that was a massive defeat for the British, which brought them to the negotiating table and granted the Transvaal Republic their independence after this first world war. Ian Hamilton had been quite badly wounded at that battle. And um, he, he had a few bones to pick uh, with the Boers. He obviously, uh, had ridden through, risen through the ranks by then, and by the time of the Second Anglo-Boer War, 20 years later, he was a general and uh, in charge of an infantry division um, under Lord Roberts. So this started five years before, and this house here is a contemporary photograph um, of another Duancourt battlefield, and this was the end of the Jamison Raid which some people regard as the first battle of the Anglo-Boer War. Uh, this is where um, Leander Star Jamison assembled a force of 600 irregulars um, from two different police forces, uh, the Betuanaland police um, and essentially the Rhodesian police, the Mashonaland Mounted Rifles. And they assembled at Otto's Hoop and marched into the Transvaal this force of 600 with a few cannon and some machine guns and um, provisions had been laid for them along the route to Johannesburg. And they were on the march to free the oppressed women and children of Johannesburg. But really it was just an excuse for uh, Cecil John Rhodes and his cronies to, to gain control of, the, of Johannesburg and the gold mines. Unfortunately, it didn't pan out. Uh, one of the reasons was that Jamison and his men were supposed to cut the telegraph lines, but they didn't. The night before, they had a huge party. Uh, they had quite a few cases of champagne, and the parties that went out to cut the telegraph wires actually cut uh, the farm boundary wires. So, of course, crew in Pretoria knew exactly where the raiders were every step of the way. And so without going into the raid in too much detail, this was where Jamison was forced to surrender 
Um, it's also known as Flakfantin, but also generally known as Duenkop. And this is the farmhouse where, and the kraal where the final battle took place. And uh, he surrendered on the 2nd of January to the Boers. It was a great humiliation for the British. So this is what the site looks like now. Very, very different. Very different indeed. Um, to get back, to go forward in time again, um, this is where on the 29th of May, uh, Ian Hamilton was in charge of this sector of the battlefield. And he was determined to do battle on the same terrain where this humiliating surrender had taken place five years before. So we go back five years from May 1900, and there you see a prospector's trench and the farmhouse in the background. And this was where some of the raiders were buried in this trench. Uh, there were about 72 casualties, um, of which about 30 were killed. We don't know exactly because some of the um, black retainers and um, wagon drivers were killed as well, and those deaths were never recorded. And we also suspect that those were the victims who were buried in the prospector's trench, which was never marked. But this was the same terrain that the battle was fought later on. And there you see the remains of the crawl. This is today what the battlefield looks like. And in the corner here is the Jamison Raid Memorial. This was the crawl where the final raiders surrendered on the 2nd of January, 1896. And that is what the monument looks like. It's in good shape and it's fairly accessible to visit. Um, there's a big hardware business just opened up um, nearby. So it's quite safe to park there and wander across and visit uh, the battlefield. Quite a landmark place to see. So what was it about? You know, was it about gold? Well, it was partly about gold, but, you know, the gold belonged to shareholders, not to a country. So, yes, to control the tax base is nice. Um, and uh, certainly Kruger and his government and uh, the Transvaal Republic had got immensely wealthy through the taxes generated from gold. And here's the man who, um, one of the men who, who, uh, who discovered the main reef, George Walker, is buried um, in the Burgerswerp Cemetery, which is not too far away from Duenkop. And, uh, you know, him and George Harrison, who discovered the main reef um, in February 1886. Uh, George Harrison sold his free claim and went up north and was never seen again. Some believe he was killed by lions. Um, but George Walker survived and he actually worked on the mines. And uh, as you can see, he died in September 1924. And uh, he was one of the men who, who started it all. Um, this is the remains of a, of a wooden headgear in the area on the Krugersdorp uh, Ranfantine Road, also very, very close to the battle site, Duenkop. Now, from the headgear um, of the neighboring mines at Durban, Rudapur Deep, and here, um, the citizens uh, climbed up these headgear twice, uh, once 2nd of January, 1896, to watch what was happening on Duenkop Battlefield with Jamison and his raiders. And the second time they climbed was on the 29th of May, 1900, when they watched this vast British army approaching the Boers on the ridges. And on the Western Ridge opposite here uh, was Ian Hamilton and about 20,000 soldiers. On the far left, General French and the cavalry was doing his usual successful cavalry act of getting behind the Boer positions. So he was encircling the, the Boer Western positions, in other words, their right flank, and he did that very successfully. So it was actually unnecessary for this man, General Ian Hamilton, to advance with a head-on attack um, straight towards the Florida Krugersdorp Road. Um, but he was determined to relieve um, or to avenge the humiliation caused by the surrender of Jamison. So he 
ordered, um, first of all, the 21st Brigade under Bruce Hamilton, General Bruce Hamilton, and then afterwards the 19th Brigade under General Smith Dorian to advance against very, very strongly held Boer positions. And this is a contemporary drawing of the battle. So the Boer positions are there, and you can see the British advancing on foot. And who did he choose? But the Gordon Highlanders. And the Highlanders stood up, and they marched across this open terrain. They killed swinging with this typical swagger. Yes, they were a couple of yards apart, but they were crossing on open felt, which had just been burnt, straight into a well-fortified Boer position. But of course, there weren't 6,000 Boers there. There were only about 300. But Ian Hamilton hadn't caught up with the times, and he didn't know about the successful tactics of, of his fellow generals. And that was having an artillery barrage to prepare the way before you sent the infantry in. So this poor, these poor um, uh, Gordon Highlanders had to advance. There was about 650 of them across open ground. They were total sitting ducks. And this is what the position looked like on the Boer side. They were behind these great big boulders and the British Gordon Highlanders had to advance across total open ground and towards them and had just been burnt in felt fires. So with the, the khaki, which had worn by this stage to almost white, they were absolutely perfect targets for the British, uh, for the Boers. So they started falling. Um, and in 10 minutes, they had lost 100 men, 18 killed and 80 wounded. Churchill, who was a witness to the battle, said that this should never have happened. Um, obviously, General French had already outflanked the Boers, and this was totally unnecessary. And Ian Hamilton made a couple of excuses. He said he was pushing through to Florida because his men were starving. They hadn't had rations for a couple of days. Um, he also didn't want to create a gap between General French and the main army in the the Germiston area where the main railway from Durban to Johannesburg was. And uh, so he said, no, he had to push ahead and not create any gaps that the Boers could exploit. And that was one of his excuses. Um, the 21st Brigade were, were actually a lot wiser. These are men of the um, City Imperial Volunteers. And they, by this stage, had learned their lesson quite well. And they would form a head and shoulder protection, give covering fire, and they would advance in sections. So the one section would cover another section. Uh, whereas uh, the, the, the Gordon Highlanders steeped in tradition would swagger into battle, swinging their kilts with fixed bayonets and impervious to danger. This is how they were trained. So there was uh, a lot of wounded men, 80 wounded men, some dying men, and this was Lance Corporal, Corporal Mackay, and he attended to the wounded under close fire. Um, he had no cover, but he went from wounded person to wounded person, dressing their wounds, and for this he got a Victoria Cross. Um, we, we'll meet him later in another battle, seven weeks later, at the Battle of Dwasfle, where he did exactly the same thing. He ran out from cover under fire to rescue an officer, and um, uh, Captain Younger, uh, a dying officer, and he raced him behind um, a copy into cover. And for that, he should have been awarded a bar to his VC, but he wasn't. There were two other Victoria Crosses that were won at that battle. And uh, even though he deserved uh, a second VC, uh, Corporal Mackay didn't get one, but what a brave man. And this is the memorial which, uh, to the Gordon Highlanders, which is just behind Rudaport Deep Mine um, in Rudaport, and a series of these um, these type of monuments have been erected uh, to the uh, Gordon Highlanders. Another one that I know about is at the Battle of Birkendal. You'll find a monument just like this with all the dead, the the eighteen dead listed on this. 
um, kind of in the old tradition of uh, when the Scots went off to fight their neighbouring clan, they would all put a stone um, in a pile. And then the, when they came back, they would pick up their stone and take it back home. And the ones that didn't return, the stones would be there and this was a memorial. So this is very much the kind of origin of, of this kind of memorial. Um, the Boers also had one like that, okay? And that was part of Kroll, where um, in 1879, they had a huge meeting at a place called Potterkroll, which is now part of Krugersdorp. And they all made a vow that they would not rest and give up until the British um, were kicked off out of the Transvaal Republic and it was a republic again. So they put a whole pile of stones as part of their vow. And later on, this monument was built over it. Well, shortly after the Battle of Duenkorp, uh, when the British took control of the whole reef and had a big base at Krugersdorp, they decided as an act of revenge to remove all these stones uh, that the Boers had so carefully placed uh, during their vow in 1879. And they put them in a railway truck and they transported them down to the Vol River and they dumped all these stones in the river. Until the 1930s, when a parcel arrived with a letter from uh, a major Jordan, uh, J-O-U-D-A-I-N, and he said that he'd been a god when these stones were loaded onto the carriages. And he actually kept one. And he kept it all these years. And he actually sent it back to the mayor of Krugersdorp. And it's now in, in a well-guarded uh, well safe um, somewhere in the municipal buildings. So that's the only remaining stone from this huge pile uh, when the Boers took their vow. So some of the British dead, um, and specifically the Gordon Highlanders, are buried in this cemetery in Maraisburg. And you can see I've got there before recycling and after recycling. So this is what the cemetery used to look like when they had uh, the iron crosses which were put there by the Guild of Loyal Women. In fact, um, in all the military cemeteries uh, in South Africa, until in recent times, it was discovered that they had some value at scrap metal dealers. And so they were yanked out and recycled in scrap metal dealers. But the War Graves Commission has since replaced these headstones with granite headstones, which can't be recycled um, at... Uh, scrap metal dealers, but they don't look as impressive and as reverent as they used to. And these are some of the victims of, um, of the Battle of Dwarsflay, uh, May 1900. So the only officer killed um, of the Gordon Highlanders was Captain St. John Mayrick. And uh, this is a very, very interesting headstone. Um, in that it's got a typical epitaph for soldiers, which is from Matthew. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy, thy Lord. It's quite common. There, there is one. It's actually quite amusing um, in Calcutta. And it's, um, it says there, um, dedicated to the memory of Captain James Butler, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, accidentally killed by his Batman. Well done, good and faithful servant. But this one is a lot more serious. And if you see here, um, it says, um, Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 26, verses 23. Aha. Uh -huh. But then you go back and you say, Uh uh, it doesn't say that. The quote for well done, good and faithful servant is in fact Matthew 25, verses 23. But you can see here, it has deliberately been put 26 verses 23. And when you go to that verse, it says something totally different. And what I believe is what the men felt about this officer who led a hundred men um, into this terrible hail of bullets in which 18 of them died. So what Matthew 26 verses 23 says, one who dips his bread in the dish with me, will betray me. Aha, so was that a subtle message from the men who said, 
this officer betrayed us. Um, at the time I discovered this 35 years ago, I wrote to the British War Graves Commission and I asked what their opinion was. I said, this is my opinion. And you know, they did concur. They said, we do think it was a deliberate misquote. So that ends my presentation beyond the fact that uh, this is what was the First World War Dead Man's Penny. And this was awarded to a member of the Gordon Highlanders killed at the Battle of the Somme. My great, great uncle, Gideon Wilson, his body was never found. So I have his medals and his penny, and uh, so this presentation is in memory of Gideon, of Gideon Wilson. 